you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. Amen. If you're glad to be at Concord, say oh yeah. Oh yeah. Man, we are glad you're with us this morning. You have come to worship with us. If you are new this morning, if it's your first time with us, we are glad you're here and uh, you are already family. Uh, The first time you come in this place, uh, we hope that you feel that way. If you uh, need more information about us, you will find a card in the seat back in front of you. You can scan that QR code. It'll give you uh, some information about us and you can give us some information about you. Uh, as we continue to welcome you. Also, there's a gift for you in the lobby when you leave today. Hey, uh, we have been talking, I've been talking to many of you about this pickleball tournament coming up, and I just want to remind you guys. Yes, listen to that. We need you to get registered. So please go on the website, go on the app on your phone, get registered because we need to be putting the brackets together, the teams together, trying to raise money for this mission trip. So uh, if you know anybody that likes pickleball or you just want to give it a try, please, please get registered. We would love to hang out with you and uh, enjoy some fellowship time together. Absolutely. Coming up real soon, I believe it is this Friday. next yeah. Friday, this Friday, right here, coming up, uh, Concord versus Concord at the uh, ballpark. We're going to have a, a wonderful uh, fair game where both teams <laughs> have an equal chance to win the game. And uh, we're going to play two games at, at Smyrna Park, and we would love for you guys to come out and cheer on either team, the whole church. We're just going to have a blast. We're just going to make it a Concord party at the ballpark. That's right. Sounds good. Uh, last week, you may have noticed in your email that we started something new. Uh, immediately following the Sunday morning service, you will see a list of questions uh, that give you an opportunity to go a little bit deeper, uh, have some discussion questions. So if you're in a small group, we hope that you utilize those questions in your small group to kind of set that base for you. Maybe you just go out to lunch with friends or with family, and these questions kind of allow you to continue on the conversation from Sunday morning. So if you're not receiving those, if you will let us know this week, we can make sure that you are on the list, you're getting those. So uh, we don't send them out too early because we don't want to give away, you know, all the good stuff. But uh, about 11 o'clock, you should see that in your email today, and we would love for you to continue on growing deeper and understanding what Christ has for us. This morning, I have an opportunity. Avery is going to come and help me, and I would like to welcome John and Bev Hill to the platform. Will you welcome them this morning? Now, you guys have been around here uh, a long time, and you know that John and Bev are not new to the Concord family. They have been here for a very long time. But John and Bev, get over here. John and Bev are going to be stepping into a new role that I am extremely excited about. Uh, They are going to become our legacy directors. Uh, So they are going to oversee all of our legacy ministry, uh, ministry for 55 and up. And uh, we are just excited. We feel very blessed. We feel like God has really answered uh, a prayer that we have had for a long time for somebody that can uh, oversee. And as I told John, uh, I need somebody that can help us as a church 
church, love on a group of people that I love very, very much. And uh, they have stepped into that role. So John and Bev, thank you so much. Here is a, a, a gift for you. Uh, there are some Concord goodies in there, uh, some honey and some different things. Oh, yeah, there you go. You scare me to death. That's, that's right. But uh, John, uh, just talk to us just briefly about uh, your vision. You're answering the call for what it, le- what it means to uh, lead this ministry. First of all, I know you're all saying, John, you're not anywhere close to being 55. <laughs> but I married a much older woman, and so that kind of grandfathers me into the group. Uh, actually, we make a good team. I'm more analytical, have a finance background, organization, those kind of things. I practice social distancing before COVID, so <laughs> I'm not super, but Bev is very social. Uh, it's worked good for us, we're a good team. Uh, it'll be 49 years this Ju- July, so awesome. it's been, been quite a while that, uh, that she has put up with me, but she's very much more connected with the needs of people. She knows probably everybody's name in, in, in the congregation, and uh, so I think as a team, I think we work together well. We did put a link in the uh, newsletter. There's some questions that we want, activities that you'd be interested in doing. Um, maybe you don't like the name Legacy, you want to call it something else, we can do that. If you have trouble with technology, just check with your grandkids, because I'm sure that they can uh, help you, or Bree Wood or myself. But uh, as, as, as uh, Pastor Jason was saying, uh, this just kind of, I had heard a rumbling that we were looking at opening up a, a minister of senior, and, it, and the Lord just kind of hit me. I, I try, you know, I teach in electives and stuff. But as I get older, I'm thinking, I don't need to be engaged as much, right? Let the young people do all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the Lord really laid on my heart that it may be an opportunity for, for us as a team to kind of step up and, and lead those that are the older generation that have their own. I said it's, it's a wide range, 55 to 75 or so. You've got different the, you know, health issues. Uh, you have different uh, economic issues going on. Uh, but we do want to be able to do things like help with, with ministries, visitations for hospitals and, and shut-ins. But we want to have some fun, too. So we're going to actually start off with a uh, Memorial Day barbecue bash at our house. More details to follow. Just kind of keep that open on for Memorial Day. We'll start there, and then as we uh, actually start getting some feedback uh, on, on this list, we'll start preparing a, a, some formal activities. Uh, we want to be an active group. Doesn't mean you have to come to every activity, but hopefully we have a, enough variety to keep you engaged both in the church and outside the church. That's awesome. Miss Bev, anything from you? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> Will you officially welcome them as the directors of this new ministry? Thank you. We're gonna celebrate all day long today. Today is the beginning of celebration. We're celebrating a number of our college graduates today and that step in life. And I said this last Sunday and you probably already heard, I really believe that we are in a unique position as a church to be one of the most intergenerational churches that I have seen in a very long time. God desires to use all generations to speak to one another and to continue to see his kingdom come and his will be done. So we're excited for the launch or the establishment of this ministry, but guys, we all have a part. We all have a role. We all have a place, but we can't fulfill our place and our role until we are willing to put ourselves out there. So this morning, I'm just going to ask you, man, would you just open your heart and open your mind to what God has to say to you today? There are no throwaway Sundays. There is not a, a day that it doesn't matter to come into the house of the Lord, but this morning, God probably wants to speak something into you but you can't hear him unless you are willing this morning. So I'm gonna ask our ushers to make their way forward. We begin every service the same way. We believe it's an act of worship to give back to God what he has blessed us with. It's our first act of faith. And as we do that, I'm just gonna ask, would you just bow your heads and pray with me in this moment? And will you simply whisper a prayer that just says, God, I'm here, I'm open, I'm available. I desire to hear what you have for me today. And maybe even in this very moment, would you just go ahead and answer whatever God's going to lay on your heart today? Will you go ahead and tell him, yes, yes, I will go. Yes, I will do. Yes, I will serve. Yes, I will become whatever it is that you're asking of me this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we are excited and we are in just a sense of celebration together today. We, uh, we ask God that you would allow us to sense you in a brand new way 
that we would immediately respond in this moment and say, God, we understand that you are calling us, you are moving us to become more like you. And today is one of those opportunities. God, I pray that you would bless these offerings, that you would use them for the furtherance of your kingdom right here in our community, but also around the world, God, as we continue to serve you in all that we do. We pray this in your son, Jesus Christ's name, and all my family said, amen.
be seated this morning. Uh, this morning we are going to celebrate uh, some of our college graduates, some of those who have completed some degrees. And as we were just singing that song, uh, there are some of you that are exhaling this morning because God has seen you through. Amen. Um, uh, I've got a lot here because God continues to bless us, as we've already said this morning. So I'm going to roll uh, through this. First is Hannah Brock. Uh, Hannah says, I have loved my time as a student at Trevecca. I've made so many amazing friends and memories that I will carry with me forever. As a COVID senior, I would love to be able to tell my freshman year self that it does get better. Freshman year was incredibly difficult because we had so many limitations, but we have come back from that stronger than ever. Getting to walk the line on Saturday was somewhat surreal. I'm glad that I finally had the opportunity to do it, and I'm so blessed to have had the opportunity to be a part of both Trevecca and the Concord family. I would just like to say thank you to everyone who's poured into me over these four years. This church has impacted me more than you could possibly know. I love you guys. I hope to be continuing my education in the fall by pursuing a Master of Arts in teaching at Trevecca, and I want to become an elementary school teacher. Will you say congratulations to Hannah? Adam Newman says, I'm still not sure what exactly I'm going to do after college, but I've applied to a couple of jobs and I just plan to get a job and to start working. I just got an apartment 10 minutes down the road on Murfreesboro Road and I'll be in Nashville for at least the next year. We hope longer. So does his parents. Uh, one thing I learned outside of the classroom is that the opinions of others really don't matter as much as God's opinion does. It's the only one that means something. So I would tell my freshman self that it's better to be alone or with a couple of true friends than to surround yourself with a bunch of people that don't lift you up to become who you need to be. Will you say congratulations to Adam this morning? <laughs> Julia Ballard. I completed my degree within three years while staying involved in a multitude of campus activities such as cheerleading, writing for the school paper, and more. In my final semester, I began working a full-time job with the state of Tennessee in the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And we'll continue, yes, and amen. We'll continue to do so for the foreseeable future. I plan on taking a small break from school before beginning a master's program in multimedia journal journalism. Uh, or PR. I'm so excited to be able to stay in Nashville, and so are we. Close to our Concord family, I want to say thanks to everyone that has poured into me for the last few years. One thing that I learned outside the classroom is that it's more important to surround yourself with different types of people. Older people, younger people, boys, girls, each person will bring new perspective. They'll bring outlook and lessons for you to learn about. When asked, what are you looking forward to the most post-graduation, Julia said, adjusting to my adult life and learning all that comes with it and also having my own bathroom. <laughs> Will you say congratulations to Julia? Sarah Ann Key says, I worked at Trevecca as a graduate assistant in the Office of Admissions while pursuing my master's degree. Throughout my master's program, I learned many things. The three things that I would highlight include the importance of connecting with people, intentionally listening to others that have expertise, and the power of presenting with boldness. Uh, since finishing up my degree and my time at Trevecca, I've enjoyed baking bread, watching Little House on the Prairie, and being married. I'm eagerly looking forward to beginning my job search. We say congratulations to Sarah Ann. <laughs> Bailey Sharp says, my name is Bailey. I'm from a small town in Blythewood, South Carolina. So I came to school at Trevecca because I wanted to be closer to my brother. Come on, y'all. Says, I've made such wonderful friends that I've decided to stay. Amen. I'm currently job hunting. I would love to work in business and sales. I'm excited to see what the Lord has next for me. One thing I've learned outside the classroom is it's not as funny when the cup of ice water gets thrown on you while you're in the shower. Something I've already forgotten is accounting. I'm most excited about the growth of my relationship in the church and having more time to spend with everybody. And if I could tell my freshman self something, I would say, hey, pay more attention in accounting because you're gonna need it for business and finance. Would you say congratulations to Bailey? <laughs> Nate.
Nicole Hubs. I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. I moved to Nashville in 2008 after graduate school to work at Belmont. I also worked at Trevecca for seven and a half years before moving to Nashville State Community College in 2018, where I currently serve as the director of the Welcome Center and Career, Ser Career Services. I'm passionate about higher education, and I love talking about college with high school students. I live with two boys named Charlie and can often be found on a walk or planning my next Universal Orlando vacation. One thing I've learned outside the classroom, in my experience, completing a doctoral degree takes a lot of motivation and persistence, especially the dissertation process because the work is completed independently. I learned so much about the capacity of work that I can take on and manage in addition to working full time. I learned that I can do really hard things. Looking forward uh, next, I'm looking forward to next month presenting my dissertation research at a National Student Affairs Conference in Indianapolis, which is a brand new first for me. Will you say congratulations to Dr. Nicole Hubs. Seth Jarrett, he says, in my undergrad, I've learned what it means to be a leader. Yes, sometimes uh, it can be the guy who takes charge and runs into battle, but it can also be the person who instills confidence in others, delegates responsibility and taking it for himself. Anyone can be a leader, but true leadership comes when others lead after you. Something I've already forgotten about is chemistry. No clue how to do any of that stuff anymore, but I passed, so who cares? I'm really excited to see where God takes me. I am unsure what he wants uh, me to do next with my career, but I'm trusting him. I want him to lead me wherever that is. I will be in the Knoxville Fellows Program working towards a master's in leadership and ethics from Johnson University. When asked, what do you, tell your fresh, what do you wanna tell your freshman self now? He said, life isn't that big of a deal. Stuff happens, but you'll get over it in about a week at most. And 99% of the time, it won't affect your life whatsoever. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow can worry about itself. Will you say congratulations to Seth? <laughs> Kyler Hayes. We asked Kyler, what's one thing you learned outside the classroom? And he said, I learned how to cook, um, which is probably good. He said he has already forgotten how to get to his classes and he's very much looking forward to no more ramen noodles. If he could tell his freshman self one thing, it would be don't take any of those 8 a.m. classes. Kyler is currently looking for a job in finance while he works on his master's degree. Will you say congratulations to Kyler this morning? I told you it's a day of celebration. Some of you right now are reminiscing those moments in your life and you're thinking back to that time that you walked the line and those degrees that you got. God has blessed us with an opportunity to see these students through this life. There is nothing that thrills me more than when a student will say, I felt loved, welcomed, and found a family at Concord Community away from home. That means we're doing what we're supposed to do as a kingdom of God. My second thing that I love the most is when they say they're gonna stay. And I love the fact that so many of these students are saying that Nashville is gonna be your home, but not just Nashville, that Concord community is gonna be your home because we need you. We need all generations, but we need generations of leaders that will serve, that will learn to show what the generation that comes behind them can look like when they give themselves fully to Christ. I'm gonna pray this morning. If you are close to one of these graduates, I would just encourage you to just lay hands on them this morning. And we're gonna pray all through this place for what God is doing in and through all of our lives together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I am so thankful. I'm blessed. We are blessed as your church to be able to celebrate these milestones. But God, more importantly, we have the opportunity to celebrate life lived with you today, God. And we ask that as so many are seeking directions for the next step, what that job is gonna be, what that next career is gonna be, when to, to maybe uh, experience a, another degree or to extend their education. God, that you would just make all of those things so abundantly clear the way that you can and you will do for them. 
Help us as a Concord family to continue to welcome everyone that comes into this place with open arms. Allow them to know that this really is a family and this really can be a home away from home. Help these students who have completed this process to now move into another uh, moment of leadership to realize that it's their turn to welcome the next generation and to love on them the way that they have been loved on. We pray all this in your son, Jesus Christ's name and all my family said, amen.
Please, before you leave today, Bree has a gift for you from us, and so we want to make sure that you see her in the lobby uh, afterwards. We're continuing on in our series. For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about these encounters with Jesus, and if you were with us last week, we talked about an encounter that happens on the road to Emmaus, and it happens just after the death of Jesus. And what we talked about was the way that these guys just missed it. They just missed this opportunity of what God was doing, even though that everything was right in front of them. And this week, after talking about what happened just after Christ's death and resurrection, we're going to talk this morning about what happens just a few days before all of that went down. We're going to talk about uh, what happened before the the arrest and the crucifixion and, and this encounter, because this encounter was different than that one. And the encounter where they somewhat missed it, we're going to explore an encounter where this person didn't miss it at all. Instead, her encounter is going to teach us what it looks like to truly understand just who Jesus is. If you want to follow along with us or turn with us this morning, if you'll look in Mark 14, that's where we're going to be uh, together today. Uh, Before we get there, I want to take us back to a special moment that happened in the life of Concord. While I was preparing for this message, I I began to think about uh, this moment that happened. It was Ash Wednesday of 2023. Some of you might have been with us that night. We had decided to kind of move from a, a different format than what we had used in the past. And what we decided was we were going to move to an, an intentional night of worship as we prepared ourselves for this this journey of Lent and what it looked like. But like we do with all of our services, it's just part of what we do as pastors. We we sit around and we, we pray about what God has for us. We pray about the message that he wants us to share, what's on our heart, and, and uh, we pray and we plan. And then we prepare a schedule uh, of what uh, that should look like, when we should sing this song and when we should administer the ashes and, and all of these different pieces. And so we planned and prepared what we intended to be about a four 45 minute service. It's Wednesday night. It's the middle of the week. People got things to do. And we believe that God was going to do what God needed to do in about 45 minutes. Some of you are thinking it's been 45 minutes. That sounds good, but we're not there today. All right. But something happened. We reached the end of the scheduled program and this strong presence of God began to fill this place. I've been in ministry for a very long time and I've experienced a movement like this, but they're rare. And this night you could sense his spirit moving and doing things. And we reached the end of our scheduled program. But everyone knew that God was not done doing what God wanted to do. And Brent and his team just began to, well, first of all, I was sitting over there and Brent was like, again? And I was like, again. And Brent would play another song and we would worship. And then we'd get to the end of that song And he'd just go into another song. And then we'd go into another song. And Tate was up in the booth, and Tate was trying to keep up with with what lyrics were supposed to go next to what song because we were just totally off program at this point. And we began to worship, and people began to move, and, and they did things that were really weird in the church. They got up, and they came to the altars. And they moved across the sanctuary and they laid hands on one another and they began to pray and they began to to kneel on their chairs and, and something was wildly just different about this night. Moms and dads went to the nursery and they pulled their kids out of the nursery to come in to experience this. And we had already administered ashes on those that were in in the service, but then moms started bringing their children forward for me to administer ashes on their forehead. And and what was supposed to be a 45 minute time together turned into about three hours of constant worship. And I, I, I think about that as I prepared for today's message because it wasn't about keeping up with the songs or what song to go to next. It was the heavy presence of worship in this place. That sure, it was the middle of the week. Sure, we had jobs to get to the next day. But nothing mattered but being in the presence of God in that moment. It didn't matter what other people thought. We weren't afraid to to put our hands in the air. We weren't afraid to move forward. We weren't afraid to go lay hands on other people. We weren't afraid to do these things that God was asking us to do because we just wanted to be with Jesus that night. Some of me longs a little bit for all of our times together to feel that free. 
maybe not all three hours worth, but a long time of being together and simply being with Jesus. And I thought about that night because as I was reading this encounter that we're going to look at in Mark, what we see is when you really encounter Jesus, the only appropriate response is to fully worship him. When you really encounter him, the only reaction that we can have is to fully worship him. So we're going to look at this encounter with a woman who has a, an incredible story of inspiration and she never says a word. Look in Mark 14 uh, verse 1, it says, Now, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people might riot. With this information, we can kind of gather that this is probably Tuesday, possibly Wednesday of Holy Week. The betrayal, the mock trial, the crucifixion, these are all days away. And these religious leaders have already made up their mind, Jesus has got to go. This rebel has got to be silenced, but they know that they can't do it in this moment. So it, it shifts from this scene of people that want Christ dead, and it opens up this new scene of people that truly love him and have left everything for him. Look at verse three. It says, while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. It was made of pure nard, she broke the jar, poured the perfume on his head. So we see that they're reclining at the table and they're reclining at the home of Simon the leper. We don't know a whole lot about Simon the leper. I believe that if Simon was still a leper, then they probably would not be at his house reclining at his table. It just wouldn't have happened that way. So Simon the leper is probably someone who's been healed by Jesus. And so he's in this home with, with someone who he has healed. And in John's account of this encounter, he gives us like a, a roll call of all the people that are there in the house, all these people that love Jesus. He says the 12 disciples are there. All 12 are there. Again, this is before the betrayal. So all 12 are gathered in the house, these guys that had spent years with Christ. It says that Lazarus is there, the man that Jesus raised from the dead. If you grew up in church in the 90s, you might be hearing Carmen's voice right now in your head singing, Lazarus, come forth, okay? If you didn't grow up in church in the 90s, you missed it. Uh, it was the weirdest time of Christian music ever, um, but we loved it. And, uh, and so, so here we have this story, and, and Lazarus is there, and then Lazarus' sisters are also there. Mary and Martha are also present. This is uh, not Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's also not Mary uh, Magdalene. I think in the Bible, they had as many Marys as we have Brads at Concord Community. They were just all over the place. Uh, you just, just, there's just lots of Marys. And so this Mary was the Mary of Bethany. And so we got this full house, man. The house is full. And the house is full of people that love Jesus. It's full of people that love him deeply. These are close friends. These are the people that actually know him. They have a deep relationship. They love him. They're close. And I can't say for sure what Mary's intentions were that night, but I, I can't say for sure what, what Mary knew about what was coming in the days ahead, but I feel like Mary had a sensing of something that was stirring and something that was taking place. From what we read, I believe that Mary, she started to get it. She started to understand that, that all these things that had been talked about may be coming to a close, that their time with Christ might be coming to an end. She can at least sense the significance of this time, and she's overcome with this love for Christ. So in this act of love, it says that she breaks this alabaster jar of what Mark describes as expensive perfume, which is a drastic understatement to what this is. The container alone would have been made of expensive stone, a, a material that was marble-like, but even softer. It was, it was rare. It probably was imported from Egypt. It would have been hand-carved to contain what was inside of it. The container alone was a, a piece of art in itself. It was very expensive, but it was also rare because nard came from a plant from northern India. It was the most expensive anointing oil of all time. In fact, it was only available to the very, very wealthy of that time. 
It had a value of what scripture tells us is 300 denarii, which is about a full year's salary. So it's, it's rare. The container is a piece of art. It is a year's salary in this, in this jar of, of, of oil. And this container of perfume would have been the absolute most expensive thing that she could have possibly owned. It was the most impossible thing for her to have. In fact, many believe that it was probably something that was passed down to her. It was probably a, an heirloom. So not only is it extremely expensive, but it has sentimental value as well. It was significant. It was important. It was the best that she had. And it wasn't just something that she would have just shown up with to a dinner party. She didn't just carry this around on a whim. Uh, I remember when Stephanie and I got engaged, we had dated all through our years at Treveca and uh, we were poor college kids. And one of the things that we would do because it was a cheap date was go to Opryland Hotel and just walk around. Uh, it didn't cost a lot and uh, it was pretty and they didn't charge for parking back then. And so we would, uh, we'd go walk around for a cheap date. And, and on this particular night, I knew that it was time that I was going to ask Stephanie to spend the rest of our lives together. And so that night uh, we went to, uh, to dinner and then we went to Opryland Hotel and we were walking around. It's a story for another time, but the hotel was under construction and I got lost. Um, and, it, it, and by the time that I actually asked the question, she was like, I am extremely tired. Are we done with this yet? Um, but uh, we, we had this one spot that I was trying to get to. And at this one spot, there were these benches and there was a fountain that came down from the ceiling. And, and we would sit at those benches. And, and long before this time, we would talk about what life would look like together if we spent our, our entire lives together. And so I just knew that was the place, that was the spot. And so as we were preparing to get there, I, had, I was wearing cargo pants, okay? Because cargo pants, listen, they were in style. Early 2000s, everybody had the cargos. I, I heard they're coming back around. That sounds fantastic to me. Uh, they were very functional. And so I, I had my cargo pants on. And, and so I, I had taken the ring and I had, I had put it in this cargo pant. And so the whole night as we had gone to dinner and we're going up and down escalators and we're walking through, every now and then I just kind of pat that cargo pant to make sure that, that that ring was still there. I don't know that I've ever been more nervous in my life. Not nervous that she wasn't going to say yes. We had been together four years. She hadn't left yet. So I kind of I kind of figured there was a yes coming. But this was the most expensive thing that I had ever purchased in my life. And here I was carrying it around in a cargo pan. And I, I, I thought to myself as, as I looked at this scripture, see, I, I didn't just carry that ring around in my cargo pant like every day thinking like maybe this will be the day or maybe that'll be the day. I waited until I had an intentional plan, a purpose for what I was going to do with that ring. And I believe when we look at this story of Mary, she didn't just happen to have this jar with her that night. She had prayed, she had planned, she had prepared. And so she had this very expensive perfume with her in that moment. She didn't just happen upon this prized possession. She knew what she wanted to do. And then she doesn't just open it up and just pour out a little bit. It says that she breaks the entire container because it was intentional. She planned to use all of it. It wasn't an accident. She wanted to break this container. She wanted to give all that she had. And so it, she pours it on Jesus. And, and Mark says that she pours it on his head. But in John's account, it says that she pours it on his head and all over and, and on his feet as well. And, and then it describes that she, she gets down and she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. Again, this wasn't an accident. There were other things nearby. They washed feet all of the time. There was something else that could have been used to, to wipe Jesus' feet, but this was another act of worship. It was saying, even the value of my hair is no more valuable than my relationship with you, Jesus. You have the most expensive perfume that I have, and I am anointing you with this, and then I am, I am worshiping you, and I am wiping your feet with my hair because I need you to know how much you mean to me. You mean everything to me. There's nothing more important than you. This, this, uh, this nard was very fragrant. 
only a little bit would have gone a long way and she has broken the bottle. And so the whole house is, is likely filled with the aroma of this oil. From his head down to his toes, she anoints Jesus. She, she bows at his feet in this act of worship. And so as she's doing that, She's worshiping with all that matters to her. And I imagine that this act of worship probably caught some of the others off guard. Remember all the other people that are in the house? All 12 disciples are there. Lazarus is there. Uh, this man that's been healed is there. And Mary and Mar uh, Martha is also there. And, and so all of these people that, that Christ also means a lot to them are present in this moment. And they couldn't have predicted what was going to happen. They, they couldn't see into the cargo pocket. They, they didn't know what was about to, to take place, but she didn't care. She didn't care what anybody else thought. She didn't care what they were about to say about this act of worship that she had. In fact, we see two very different reactions. It says some of those that were present were saying indignantly to one another, why waste this perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. They say, why would you do such a thing? Why would you waste this very valuable thing? But not Jesus. Jesus says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor will always uh, have with you. you. You always have the poor with you and you can help them anytime that you want to, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Makes you think a little bit about those guys on the road to Emmaus, right? All of these moments of not missing anything. And Jesus says, this isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's not that Jesus doesn't care for the poor. His entire ministry demonstrates love and care for the poor. But what matters is Jesus is saying, don't miss this moment. Don't become sidetracked on what we're spending money on, who we could serve, what we could do better. Don't miss a moment of what is significant right now. In this room full of people that love Jesus, I kind of wonder if that negative reaction maybe came from a little place of conviction in their heart. They hadn't thought to do something like this. They hadn't thought to express their love for Christ in this way. Maybe Mary's done something that they were unwilling to do. They had seen all the miracles. They had heard the countless messages. They had walked all the miles with Jesus. And they'd shared all these meals, but now here's this woman that is worshiping in a way that they didn't because Mary got it. She desperately wanted to say to Jesus exactly what he meant to her before she ran out of time. She wanted Jesus to know there is nothing more valuable in life than you, Jesus. There is nothing more valuable in life than you, is that your testimony this morning? I mean, do you wake up every morning and do you say to Christ, there is nothing more important than you? My job's not more important. My kids aren't more important. My, my, my next step, my next step in education, nothing is more important than you, Jesus, because that's what Mary was doing. In this encounter with Jesus, she understood that her only appropriate response to an encounter with him was to fully worship him with everything that she had. So what is this teaching us today? Well, the first thing I think it's teaching us is that worship to Jesus is countercultural. The world that we live in and work in every day doesn't worship Jesus 24 seven, the way that we should be worshiping him. It's countercultural to worship him that way. Mary continued to worship Jesus no matter what everybody else said and no matter whether they worshiped him or not. She chose to put her focus on him fully, no matter what they thought or they said. Also, worshiping Jesus leaves a lasting impression. The aroma, think about the aroma of her worship that night that, that filled the house. It filled the whole house. The strength of that perfume likely made everybody in attendance smell like this perfume. It's like when you go to lunch at Martin's after church. Everyone can't deny where you had lunch because you smell like barbecue. This is what happened. They left the house and no one could deny where they had been. In fact, Jesus couldn't deny where he had been. Think about the strength of this perfume that had been poured from his head to his feet and then the days that were about to happen. That means the smell of that sweet perfume was on his body the night that he was portrayed. The smell of that perfume was there. 
when he was arrested. It was there when he met with Pilate. It was there when they began to beat him. It was likely still there as he took his cross through the street. It was likely still there when they hung him on the cross. This act of worship had permeated him and everyone around knew this act of worship from this woman because it left this lasting impression. Church, when we live a life of worship, our lives do the same thing in our everyday life. The aroma of our worship should penetrate everything that we do, the way that we speak, the way that we act, the way that we treat others, in our homes and in our jobs. All these things should permeate this life of worship that we have for him. When we live a life of, of worship, it really does tell everyone else around us, nothing matters more than my commitment to Jesus. In fact, worship is about being. It's not simply about doing. We don't just do worship because you listen to certain music in the car. You don't just do worship because you show up here on a Sunday morning and you raise your hands. You become a worship of Christ when you say nothing matters more than you. In fact, for those of us that graduated from Trevecca, a long time ago, somebody told us it's to be rather than to seem. It's who you're becoming. It's not what you're trying to put on. It's about who Jesus is to us. Mary became known for being at the feet of Christ, and I can't think of a better thing to be known for than to be someone who lives every day at the feet of Jesus. Ash Wednesday was impactful to me, not because of how long, not because of the songs. The impact was that the room was filled with unashamed worship. There was nothing that mattered more in that moment. The only thing that mattered was encountering Christ. So in a world where we are so tempted to worship so many other things, Mary understood that there is something more important than everything else. There is something more important than everything else. And that something is him. That something is Jesus. Does he mean that much to you? Does he mean enough to you that you would give up literally the most expensive thing that you have? Would you be willing to give up what matters the absolute most to you in order to worship him? Because that's what our encounter should do. It's not a guilt trip this morning and it's not about singing louder and it's not about whether you do the touchdown praise Jesus or the one hand praise Jesus or, or the sit and praise. It doesn't matter how you worship. It's whether your life is a testimony of what God has done through you. But there is a reason we come together like this on Sunday. There is a reason that we say Sunday should be a non-negotiable. There is this moment when we gather together that even in the midst of everything that's going on in our lives, Jesus really is the most important thing to us. Nothing matters more than this time together with him. When we encounter Jesus, we encounter that Christ who paid the debt that we couldn't pay. We encounter that Christ who died so that we could have life everlasting with him. So church, what would it look like if nothing mattered more than to worship him? What could life look like? What would be different? What would change if we lived a life of loving him back simply because he loved us? Look, I'll never be able to match the love that Christ showed me, but I'm gonna spend every day trying as hard as I can to love him back for the love that he has for us. I said this a long time ago, and I got this saying from a, a high school graduation that I attended at McGavick High School. It was my, my first year in youth ministry. And I sat in a, uh, an auditorium with all of these graduates and an assistant principal walked out to the front of the auditorium before the, the ceremony began. He looked at all the students and he said, oh yes, and I have to tell you what I tell you every single morning. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. And as a brand new youth pastor, I sat there and I thought, wow, what a powerful statement for a principal to say to his students every day. But what makes it so powerful is the love that he had for those students wasn't a love that he possessed on his own. He was simply saying, I love you because Christ loved me. So the love I have for you is what Christ did for us. Christ loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. 
when you encounter him, the only response that you can have is to simply worship him. This morning, we're gonna close in an act of worship. I'm gonna ask those that are assisting with communion this morning, if you will make your way forward. Here at Concord, we believe that everyone is welcome at the table. You don't have to be a member of this church in order to participate in one of the most special moments that Christ invited us into. In fact, he's offered everyone this chance to come to the table. And at Concord, we believe that there is an act of movement that is important to the process. Christ moved towards us. And as an act of movement, we receive communion by moving towards him. So we're gonna receive communion through intention this morning, where you will take the bread and dip it into the cup and then partake together. If you desire for your movement not to be with intention, there are some uh, single uh, elements available for you at the back of the room as well. But by receiving communion, we are simply saying to Christ, I receive your love for me. I'm thankful for your love for me. And I desire to love you back for the way that you loved us. So as you come, if you'll move from your left and then return to your seat from the right, let's move and worship together and live out this act of worship for him this morning. Oh
together to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore have a great week mm-hmm.